I was going to have a conversation with, uh, with Buratai. Unfortunately, we missed each other in Munich a few years ago. Um, the Munich Security Council, um, I'm sort of one of their consultants, I go from time to time and attended this annual meeting. And Buratai was expected. If I accepted to go to that meeting because I wanted to sit with Buratai and chat with him. Unfortunately, he was late coming in. And by the time I, I left, he, he, I understood that he went there later on. And what, I, what, what was I going to say to him? I was going to tell him that if you don't involve the people, you will lose this battle. For a virus like Boko Haram and religious extremism and fundamentalism, you need to engage the people themselves. You, let, you need to let them know that harboring a Boko Haram sooner or later is like harboring a viper. It's going to bite you sooner or later. So there was no, no real mass communication with the people themselves. It came eventually, I'm not talking about units like the Junior Task Force. Yes, that was a very beautiful move, a good strategic move, and it yielded results. But I'm talking about just the, the rest of the community, in which you make them understand the evil, the use of pamphleteering, dropping leaflets on communities. I pass this on, by the way, since then, through certain channels, that it's not just a question of bombing Boko Haram. You've got to bomb them with information. They scatter leaflets, you know, in various languages, which they will understand. Let them, they, they don't have telephone, okay, you can put uh, hotlines and say, if you see Boko Haram, you can phone this. No, but more than that, you want a continuous process of reorientation for them to understand that the government is on their side and will defend them. And they can approach you here and so on and so on. So this, is, this thing goes back. We have this expression uh, in Yoruba, Amukumwani Erwe, Erwe Wo A. Uni Ati Saleni. It's the knock kneed man. You know, you meet a knock kneed man and uh, he's carrying a heavy load on the head. And you say, ah, Mr. You think you're being helpful. You say, look, your, your load, the load on your head is skewed. And he tells you, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's from the roots, from the legs not up there. Mm. And that is one missed strategy. Since then, of course, we've learned so many things. We've learned of military officers collaborating here and there, selling weapons because they were not motivated. We learned the senior brass, you know, wolfing down billions, men to equip their soldiers, so that at one stage, these insurgents were better equipped than we were on this side. One of the most disgusting uh, episodes in Nigerian history, that even after, even after the kidnapping of our children, you had money being shared, which was supposed to go to the military, in fact, which was procured specifically for the military. And then people come and tell me that uh, uh, one doesn't eat anti-corruption and so on, because I know who said, who said it's edible. The important thing is that corruption is not just corruption, it's not an isolated phenomenon. It's something which actually affects us. Corruption is involved in the inability of the nation to meet COVID. I won't go as far as Mr. Magu. I don't know what's wrong with Magu these days, though, and say that uh, it's corruption which brought uh, COVID. You know, I think the man is isolating himself too much. He better come out and see the real world and stop talking that kind of uh, simply oversimplification of this complex uh, pandemic and so on. So I'm not going that direction. But I'm saying that we are where we are today, among other reasons, but because we have both wasted resources. Sorry, I don't know where we started. No, where no, I started I, I'm speed. staying with you, but <laughs> I'm, what, what I'm marveling at as I'm listening to you is that you, you still have, I hear from you that you still have a desire and you still see the possibility of intervening in the affairs you, you, you mentioned and somehow turning them around for good. Um, I want to ask, just going back to your personal journey, um, is there anything in your journey you would take, because you're, you're a figure that has courted controversy, you know, uh, several times. Is there, if you had the chance to undo or do things differently, it, whether in what you've written, what you've said, or what you've, you've done, is there any aspect of your activism you would, you would re-script? 
None that I can think of, except that sometimes I think that I didn't put things as strongly as I should have done. Okay. In which, in which I assume that a word is enough for the wise. I think that's been a mistake, you know, in which you don't want to reiterate, you don't want to push yourself too much, especially as you get all kinds of feedback which, make, which just disgust you, you know, and say, okay, you know, go and do it, you know. Uh, as if you're not just contributing to a pool of ideas, that people get the idea that you think the idea you've posited is the one and only idea exists. No, it's I only say what is in my head. Mm. So when I think back, I really, I think also perhaps uh, a little bit too optimistic at a certain stage. I think uh, it had to do with the with the confidence that we were a new generation and we were super, super beings. And that you know, the ideas are there, it's just a question of manifesting them. So beyond that, uh, we didn't identify and expose as strongly as you know, those who I call the enemies of the future. You know, we thought we could contain them. But that they could be shifted, they could be spoken to, that you could even work with them, collaborate with them. And two thirds of the time, even five six of the time, turned out no. They they had absolutely no agenda beyond themselves. I mean, I don't.